The True Worship One Prologue Chapter 1 Prologue The hour comes and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. John 4 verse 23 Ritualistic worship made its first real impact on me when, by a strange series of circumstances, and contrary to all my habits, I found myself in one of Europe's famous medieval cathedrals while choral mass was being celebrated. The Cathedral Church of St. Rombold at Moline in Belgium is the seat of an archbishop and is a most beautiful and imposing edifice. The soaring pillars of the vaulted nave, the clustered columns at the transept crossing, the branching tracery of the clear story windows and the still figures and deep colors of the stained glass combined to give an air of solemn, timeless otherworldliness which prepares one's senses for further impressions. Ever before the eye is the church's great art treasure, the altarpiece by Van Dyck depicting the crucifixion. There hangs the Savior between the thieves and there is Mary Magdalene standing by the cross, the living representation of passionate grief. No choir was visible, but with clearness pure and sweet the weaving threads of counterpoint echoed and re-echoed in the stone vaults of choir and nave. No rhythm marked the time, the strands of timeless melody rose and fell, crossed and recrossed, grew loud and soft. Very little imagination was needed to believe that this was indeed the celestial music itself, the voices of angels at the gate of heaven. Against this background of color and music the service proceeded. The air was heavy with incense, and the gorgeous vestments of the chanting priests completed a consummately designed and executed impact on the senses, and therefore on the mind, to produce a sensuous effect intended to be conducive to worship. The impression made on me by all this was intensified by its utter contrast with all I had known and shared in all my life as corporate worship. The points of contrast presented themselves one by one to my thoughts. Instead of the great building having everything that art and man's device could contrive to make it in a material and sensuous way worthy of God, I knew the simplest of buildings within and without devoid of ornament of any kind, having neither cross nor symbol to proclaim them houses of God. There I had known no priest, clergy, nor minister as a separate class and with special powers and privileges, any man might speak in his prayer or praise or him. There all was spontaneous and extempore, there was no instrumental music, indeed no music at all in the sophisticated and trained sense. When no person felt the urge to open his mouth, there was silence. My earliest memories included observing these gatherings of men and women of all ages, classes and rank in society, sitting silent and with eyes closed until someone was moved to speak. I soon learned that their eyes were closed for the deliberate purpose of excluding the diversions of sense, so that there might be less to impair the inner activity of mind, heart and spirit opened up to God. What they said in prayer and worship followed no liturgy, it was the free rising of the spirit in worship. What any person said was eagerly followed by the others, and quiet murmurs of agreement and support were constantly to be heard. The substance of their prayers was permeated with Bible allusions and quotations. These people knew their Bibles intimately and thoroughly, and the quiet responses to the speaker showed that by the shared knowledge of this one book, heart answered to heart and spirit to spirit, moved by these illusions. Above all, it seemed that the persons they addressed and spoke about in prayer and worship were persons they knew, the Father and the Son, and with whom they simply knew themselves to be in a settled relationship never to be broken. All this centered round the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. At the appropriate time any man who felt moved to do so gave thanks, and the loaf of ordinary bread and the cup of wine were handled by all in exact conformity with Luke 22 verse 17. Awareness of so striking a contrast as that described above was among the first impressions leading me to a lifelong interest in trying to understand the way of God more perfectly in what concerns the true Christian worship. For our guidance and instruction on this as on all other matters of real concern, we have no other source of illumination than God and the word of His grace. It is to the law and the testimony, to the scriptures of truth we must turn, and thus will be fulfilled the Savior's promise that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all the truth. No one will question that the ritualistic worship described owes much to an Old Testament religion. The ground plan of the church comprising chancel, nave and porch, corresponds to the Jews' temple with its holy of holies, holy place, and outer court or porch. In both, the inner sanctuary contains an altar. The division of the worshipping people into high priest, priests, and Levites corresponds to bishop, priests, and deacons. In both, 
the priests are clothed with garments of glory and beauty, the central part of each ritual is a sacrifice, and the priests have exclusive privileges in connection with the sacrifice. Both kinds of service proceed to the accompaniment of music and incense. It is at the same time equally clear that the ritualistic worship shares with the true New Testament worship this constant dependence on allusions to Old Testament worship. It is worthwhile to set out this point in some detail, for it can be easily overlooked, and clearly it must be given full weight in any serious inquiry concerning the true worship. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 16-17. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16. Now, therefore, ye, are built upon the foundation. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows to an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2 verses 19-22. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, Acts 17 verses 24-25. We have an high priest, who is set on the right hand. Of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. There are priests that offered gifts according to the law who serve to the example and shadow of heavenly things, Hebrews 8 verses 1 to 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2 verse 5. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us, priests to God and his Father, Revelation 1 verses 5 to 6. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, Hebrews 13 verse 15. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle, Hebrews 13 verse 10. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10 verses 20-22. A candid inquirer will notice, in reflecting on these quotations, that although the terms used are terms derived immediately from Old Testament worship, temple, priest, altar, sacrifice, the holiest, yet these terms are frequently employed to point a contrast rather than an exact parallel. They seem to say, we do have a priest, but quite a different kind of priest, we do have a sacrifice, but a new kind of sacrifice. Wherein lie the parallels and wherein exactly lie the contrasts between Old Testament and Christian worship? These are the questions which help render more specific our study. In the pages which follow, these are the questions for which we shall try to find answers in the Word of God. There is one New Testament passage, heading this chapter, which seems to gather within its brief compass all the allusions already noted and at the same to give in the words of the Savior himself the essentials of the answer we seek. This passage forms the basis of our study, and we shall seek to bring out from the whole range of Scripture some measure of the fullness of meaning contained in every one of the Savior's words recorded in John 4 verses 20-24. Read them now and observe how they take us to the very heart of the matter. The woman says to him, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes, when you shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship you know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The two examples with which we began represented extremes on a scale of rite and ceremony, of symbol and sense. Another, partly overlapping, dimension of practice in connection with worship, might be called that of a liberal modernism. Recently, immediately after the news, I heard from the BBC the beginning of an act of worship for schools. It began, so the announcer said, with Caesar Frank's violin sonata in a major, and would end with more Caesar Frank. 
it included a very nice hymn descriptive of the Savior's sacrifice and a prayer that we might become more like him. It is very common in Britain to read a permanent notice outside a church inviting all to come and worship. A significant variation on this theme is to be found in a book emanating from the Tractarian movement of 110 years ago, noting the attractions of the Gin Palace and Cheap Music Hall, and, since these were so popular and depended on light and music and histrionics for their appeal, that is indeed a benighted outlook which neglects to use these means to allure the man in the street to worship God. Underlying the three examples thus drawn together is the belief, common to all, that every child at school can be called to worship, that one of the invitations appropriately to be addressed to any man in the street is the invitation to worship or to be taught the forms of worship. These instances naturally raise the question whether it be true that anyone can be taught to worship God. That there is a worship other than the true worship is witnessed by the quotation from John 4, in which we shall seek to find the answers to our questions. To the Samaritan the Lord said, You worship you know not what. The scriptures do accord the name worship to something based on ignorance and not on knowledge to something quite apart from the true worship. With this agrees Acts 17, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Thus it is also clear that for the true worship all are not qualified. Part of our inquiry will be to find the qualifications, but is it not immediately apparent that the true worshippers know salvation, have passed through the initiatory cleansing, and above all know the person worshipped? We have hitherto been thinking in terms of a desire for knowledge and understanding arising from observation of the varied practices of Christians and we have by this been led to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, and there all such signposts are eclipsed when we seriously confront the depth and urgency of the quest of God which breathes through the words of Jesus. For what we find there shining forth and meeting our search for knowledge and understanding is nothing less than the quest of God the Father. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. In our experience as Christians we have to do first with the quest of the Son of Man, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19 verse 10. Only through the activity of the seeking Savior can we be numbered among those capable of the true worship, and we would never wish to move away from the activity of the Savior's present seeking love. It is never open to us to choose to be devoted to one more than the other of these two divine quests. A heart and mind truly renewed by the Word and the Spirit will sense to the full the commanding imperative of these two great facts, the Son of Man seeking the lost, and the Father seeking worshippers. If in the pages which follow we concentrate attention on the latter, this is never to be taken as diminishing the former. The Gospel must ever be paramount among the holy things about which the true Christian ministers to the Lord. Forth from His eternal glory with the Father, out from the love wherewith the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world, the Son of God has come. He has come to seek and to save the lost, this quest has led Him of necessity by Calvary. But beyond it there lies this other quest, through Him the Father is seeking worshippers. Only the coming of the Son could reveal the Father. Only His sacrifice could open a new and living way by which we can enter into His presence. The true worship, then, is something beyond the worship of Almighty God, even beyond the worship of Jehovah. The true worship is to worship the Father, revealed in Christ the Son. If we have begun to grasp the significance of this central passage, then in the inner chambers of love and devotion, we shall have been moved to desire above all things to respond to the seeking of the Father, and we shall search the Scriptures so that by the Spirit's illumination we may learn how to be among the true worshippers who worship the Father in spirit and in truth.